Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, um, I'm Liz Lawley from the Community Technologies Group, and I am delighted to introduce Eloise Oizan, who's a professor in the Information Technology Department at RIT, and focusing on human-computer interaction and, uh, and related topics in terms of animation and multimedia development. And she is going to be talking today about the intersection between HCI and the fine arts, and has titled the talk, I believe, The Art of cognition mm -hmm. for those of you who aren't able to make out the text on that slide uh, and I'm going to turn it over to her for the presentation. Thank you Liz. Hi. This is an intimate group and I'm okay with that. Um, my background is, is interesting in that RIT hired me in the information technology department I think they've discovered at this point that I do not hold a CS degree. I have a master in fine arts. For a long time, I thought they'd discover this and go, she doesn't really belong here, and then boot her. We'll find out. I'm up for tenure. <laughs> but um, so I got hired by the department. I'm teaching multimedia classes. And they said, you know, you could teach HCI classes, too. So at this point, I started my education coming in the back door. And I found out about Fitz Law. Fitz law for me is an expletive because basically what it says is the bigger something is, the faster you're going to get it. And my first response was, yeah, right. This is very true. You know what? We've known this for a while. We've been doing this for a long time. 1350 BC, this is a long time ago. We knew bigger was better. Bigger is not better in this case. Bigger is more important. All human beings are not to scale. Kings are bigger. Minions are small. That is by definition. Later on, we found out that holier people were bigger than everybody else. So this is the Middle Ages. Bigger is better. Not that big a deal. After a while, we figured out, you know, maybe it's not a function of space. It's not divine right. Um, it tur turns out small people end up being kings and queens. There's an underlying structure. We have cognition. We say, this is the way the word, world works. There's a hierarchy. And size, eventually, was said, we understood that size could be a function of distance. And the underlying structure would say, in the Renaissance, actually before then, in Grecian times before it got codified, got lost in the Middle Ages, came back to say, in this underlying structure, we can make it. So things that are small are in the back. Larger things are closer. Things that are bigger tend to be more important, like the bus that's about to hit you. This is important to know. And these structures end up becoming an architecture, a way we can sort of pin things into the world. That makes sense. Now, they, we can use them later on in other kind of structures. For example, interfaces that don't necessarily have to align in straight up and down grids. We can use them in other fashions. And even if we remove the underlying lines, we can still sense the structure because we need to know that there's order in the world, because otherwise we get pissed. That's our nature. So there are other ways of underlying structures. We went one-point perspective, we got two-point perspective. We got three-point perspective, which is just like a, an acid trip, so we don't do that too often. But in the fine arts, we still have it. The most important thing we want is the biggest thing. And we order your gaze to say, let's look at this thing, then this thing, and then this thing in order. I would make my students um, take a look at interfaces. I'd say, close your eyes. 
Hell, I can say that right now. Close your eyes. And then when you open them, I want you to be aware of what you look at first, second, and third. Go. Do you find yourself going in a sort of loop? That's good, because ultimately you want people to go look at your stuff and stay there. And the artist is manipulating you with every trick they have in the book to make you do that. 2004, a painting. Still the same deal. So, Fitz Law. Bigger is better. This is the target. This is what we want you to look at. And size matters. I know it's small text, so don't read it. Size matters because, aside from being female, we want you to look at something. And that thing is going to be forefront. That's just one way to do it. There are other ways. The fine artist has a problem. And the problem they're trying to solve is, I have data. I have information. I have a story to tell. And I need to guide you into it. I need to manipulate your eyes because I want to evoke a response from you. I want to push and pull you a certain place. Yes? Excuse me? You want to manipulate attention, or you're using eyes as synonymous oh. with attention. I'm manipulating their eyes with a particular intention in mind. Yes? Right, but you really are attention. Oh, attention. attention. Yeah. Yes. I want their attention. This is Jasper John's Target, 1955. So we have hierarchy. We have a hierarchy of power. We hi have a hierarchy of religion. We have a hierarchy of the visual. So Fitz Law. Someone studied this. And they said, OK, we can take a look at this stuff and codify it. And then it seems like it's this new thing, but it's not. It is a new thing to this particular field because we are looking at interfaces in terms of a digital plane, a two-dimensional window. Well, paintings have been windows for a long time. Uh, this is uh, the work of Kassara and a bunch of other Austrians. We utilize a well-known method from photography called depth of field. Their idea being that if you make other things blurry, the stuff that is in front of you of, with the greatest detail is what you're going to look at. So size matters, clarity matters. But it's been done so beautifully before. This is Dasino. I'm not French, so excuse my pronunciation. Uh, this is the kiss. It was done beautifully here. This whole scene uh, with Mrs. Robinson in which she was blurred. And you could see very clearly Dustin Hoffman's expression in The Graduate. Um, but blurred information doesn't mean the information is non-existent non -existent or unimportant. It's just less important than what the artist wants you to see. But the information, although blurred, still provides a context, an environment. So we think about this in terms of information. I have a lot of information I want to show you. Some information is more important than the others, but the information that surrounds it still can provide a context. The context being other information that is less important, but if you focus on it, it can still become important. This is a, a plugin created uh, for video editing, create 2004, 2005. And that was rather nice because it illustrated that you can shift focus. Has this been applied to data so far? No. I think that could be cool if it did. So could we say um, data points that are less reliable are fuzzy? Could we think about it in those terms? So we just think about other applications that this can hit, because we want to make sense of the world. And we do it a variety of ways. 
There's the thing that you want to look at, and there's the thing that is not there. Um, in music, rest is really important. I'll, I'll define something, uh, negative space, which some people don't really quite understand. There's figure, and then there's ground. Figure is the thing that you want to attend to. The background is that which the figure sits on top of. So another device we use to organ organize a space is say, we have things and we have non-things. So structure becomes important. The space in between things becomes important. So we have the cl clear item, we have the large item, we have the blurry item, we have the non-item. And all of those become elements that we play with. How we play with them makes, makes a difference. It turns out, if we go back to underlying structures, not all structures are the same. There's phi, phi. How do you pronounce that? Before I start going into the graduate, uh, the giants, phi, phi, fo, fo. One of those things. There's a number, and it turns out that number is very, very pleasant. Bisect one side of the square, you do this, you do that, you get a proportion. This is the golden section. It ends up being a number they're still trying to calculate. 1.6 blah, 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 to very, very far. And the proportion is such that this relationship is the same as A to C. And it turns up all kinds of places. Size matters, location matters, proportions matter. Turns out that particular section, that number, is almost magical. It is a proportion of torso to, to the femur. It is a proportion from the femur to the length of your leg. You take a look at your arms, you take a look at your fingers, you take a look at your tarsals and metatarsals and see how they fit in. It is the number that will make a nautilus shell. And it's a pleasing proportion. Yes? You uh, had a random handheld devices. Um, I had an argument with someone, not an argument, we had a long discussion about what aesthetics was. And um, usually when we talk about an aesthetic critique, you know, whether we talk about m music or movies, any sort of experience, it's usually here is a particular aspect, sensory aspect of the thing, in this case, uh, touch. And then it's followed by adjectives, a judgment. And then you follow that with the rationale. So the, the, the aesthetic experience is, I have a handheld device. Is a, uh, this particular device is pleasing to my hand because of, of its particular proportion. Is that the experience or is that an aesthetic experience? I would tend to say it, we were discussing whether or not all experiences were aesthetic. It is a comfortable number. It is a number that fits the body well. And I don't think it's accidental that things that are ergonomic are also pleasing um, through various other senses. Yes? Do you know if there's any study, neurological level, to say, is this something about our perception system that responds to the proportion? As far as I know, there's no, there's a book on it, on, on the magic of it. Is there any official study? No, there's a, there's a lot of anecdotal discussion about all the places this number shows up. But none that I know that goes into the, the specific neurology behind it. But it's good. It's a good thing. And the proportion shows up other places. <coughs> Now, this, 
this golden section taken loosely ends up becoming um, in, in aesthetics for dummies the rule of thirds. Because basically you have a one third, two thirds sort of rule. And that basically says things are more pleasing when everything is not bisect bisected centrally. And if you can locate things a little bit off, you get more a, of a dynamic feeling. But it's also more in keeping with a human view that things are not exactly proportioned. So we have underlying structures. Um, we can put things in a regular rhythmical layout, and that is somewhat pleasing because it's predictable. We can have it syncopated, and that's more Latin, and I like that. And there's exponential. But the main thing underlying it all is these are recognizable structures, and we like to make sense of the world by understanding the underlying architecture and there are various ways to do it. So we're solving a problem. And the problem is relaying lots of information. And in a two-dimensional plane, that is impossible. There was no photography in da Vinci's time. But I would say even a photograph is not entirely, um, a, a good photograph still has a hierarchy to it because the difference between noise and something that is beautiful and pleasing is that you're not thinking so much. If nothing stands out, it's static. If I have a picture that has every single person in exact detail, what do you look at? You don't know. Um, early animation drove me nuts because uh, if you look at, oh, I don't know, I just remember the demo reels from the mid-90s where everything was in burning chrome because they could, but everything had such a clarity that there was no depth of field, there was no distance, everything was clean and shiny and bright. It doesn't work that way. Leonardo knew that we could not show the entire face and have it read successfully. When you draw a face, because aside from time, time constraints and the reality of trying to draw every single strand of hair, which is ridiculous. Um, what you do is say, I will focus in on a few elements. I will say that the most important thing to, for me right now is her expression. What do I do with the rest of that information? If the line just stops, that's not so good. So what I do is I can indicate that information blurly. I can indicate that information lightly, so there's less contrast in terms of its value compared to the background, so it starts fading into the background. I can change the texture and say, things here are sculptural. You can almost see the folds of her nose. You can see that there's a space, there's a highlight, so this is forward and this is back. Here, it's less defined. Can we apply that to other kinds of information? Why not? Then the answer is yes, we should. This is old technology. This is old school. There's a lot of information in this image. All of the information in this image is not created equally, but it's all important. So we say, you should look mostly at the expression of her and what's happening between her and the baby. Oh, and by the way, the woman in the background, she's important too. She's an onlooker. She's like the Greek chorus. But you can look at her later. But then, oh, look, look at this baby. He's great. So you go back and ping pong forth, and your eye scans the page. It might be interesting to take a look at um, eye tracking and see what happens when you put paintings in front of them. But it's informative. So we know size matters. Bigger target allows for faster acquisition. Sharply defined edges allow for faster detection. OK, so we've got studies that say this. 
we, it, it, it would imply that a reduction of contrast will serve to less, lessen the importance of information. All of it, well and good. Now, the rest of the stuff that I've seen, I haven't seen many studies on. One may contrast all kinds of stuff. Now, in my artist bag of tricks, I do all kinds of things to manipulate folks. Size, okay. Transparency and opacity. Have we played with this as yet? Mm, didn't find any studies specifically on it, but um, I did find that in terms of wireframes and trying to relay information, what do you do when information in a three-dimensional world is obstructing another? You could play with transparency, and they've done that to a certain extent. One of my favorite things, this is early interactive. Uh, we had an Encyclopedia Britannica when I was a kid. And when you got to the human body, there were all these acetate sheets, and you could peel off the skin. It was, it was grisly. It was great. Um, so peel off the skin. You got to see the nervous system, the circulatory system, one layer after the other. This is an interface. This is a way of seeing things. We could make things transparent and then see the layers underneath. What if we made things transparent and blurry and played with depth of field? What would that do to us as we move through information and schemas and architecture? We can play with this. We can play with texture. We saw Leonardo's face. We saw the smoothness of the woman's skin. We saw that the hair got a little bit more wild at the edges and turned into these wispy things at the very end. Um, in three-dimensional worlds, there's a difference. Why don't we have mice that are made of glass or wood? I, that, you don't have to answer that. That's a rhetorical question. I'm just wondering, because those, those make my hands happy. The first one was made of wood. The first one was made of wood, and it was shaped like a, 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 block. a block. Actually, it was a block of wood. It's true. <laughs> it wasn't shaped like anything. It was a block of wood with wheels, but um, I'm still waiting. We can play with amount of detail. I did find some studies on this, and that is in terms of zoom. When we took, take a look at maps and you go in farther or go out, the amount of detail changes. And this is good because we can't deal with all the detail at once. And then we have this other stuff. And this is huge. Um, the information I've found so far is red means anger, and white might be death or a pure thing, depending on which part of the world you're at. A lot of, there, there's specific colors that denote emotional aspects. But it's, it's very complex. And Joseph Albers and Mark Rothko uh, they were color field painters in the 50s, 60s. They did a lot of stuff, and all they did was color. That's all they did, just blocks of color. Albers was uh, more anal retentive. His color was ordered in very specific blocks. Rothko would just do these be beautiful things, and I, w I still go to museums and just sit there a long time, and they make me happy. There are no rules for color that I could give you because color um, reacts with other color. Now, this would be the area that I would want to study if I was to try to make some sort of Wheeze Law. Uh, uh, Eloise, my nickname is Wheeze. And I don't think anyone could use Wheeze as an expletive as easily as I do fits. So, um, but if we take a look at this, it's interesting because what is foreground and background shifts. The sense of what is glowing what happens to an edge all changes considerably. And there are no easy rules because um, color is made up of different things. You can say, you can't say black is always the darkest thing and, and white will be the lightest. It depends on what's around it. At this point here, there might be a very strong sense that that's a really light part of the page. But if you isolated that color all by itself, it might be a medium gray. 
but within its context, it has a different feeling. Look at any of these colors in isolation. They don't really mean anything. You put them together, you got some things going on. How do we deal with this? How would we map this to data? That part, I'm not as certain about, but I can, but my gut tells me I can start making very rich environments if I started playing with this palette. And Rothko just makes me happy. They're not the same. So we have all these different elements. I can manipulate all these different things and try to draw you into the picture, and I can tell you what is the most important and the least important and how I should make your eyes go round. Um, there's a modernist notion in painting. Modernism was all about, you know what, the form is important. Postmodernism said, you know, what's important isn't the thing itself, it's how you read it. And nothing is ever really new. Well, it's difficult to take a look at anything that we create at this point outside of a context because images, colors, layouts will allude to things in the past. So not only do we deal in, in the arts with compositional elements, but now we have to deal with all the history and whether or not the audience has that same history. I don't know, do you remember Vanilla Ice? An ice, ice baby, a minor lawsuit, you don't know. Uh, there was a, I, I can say you don't know because he's shaking his head no, I'm not making any assumptions. Um, there was a song by Queen, and it started with dum 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 da dum dum. And ice, um, vanilla ice took a couple of chords from that, and then he used this as a sampling bit in his song. Now this is in the mid 80s, We're right in the middle of postmodernism. Instead of stealing, this was called appropriation. When you take somebody else's work and riff off of it. Aside from causing lots of difficulties with legalities, um, it did open, to the, open up the notion that something has meaning. If you know the history of it, it has more meaning or a different meaning. I could take, I could listen to Tupac Shakur's, um, is it Tupac? No, it's Coolio, sorry. Um, he does a rap song called uh, Gangsterland, Gangster's Paradise. Gangster's Paradise. And uh, it's this rap song about living in the ghetto. He is sampling Stevie Wonder's Ghetto Paradise. And if you know, if you listen to songs in the key of life in the 70s and you listen to this thing, it's richer because it's talking about the same thing but with a 30 year difference, oh, 20 year difference. So we have Art Nouveau, and we have Art Nouveau, Nouveau. We have the Kiriko and angles, and we have websites with angles that lead you down a street. We have Mondrian who played with lots of grids, and we play with lots of grids. And we're not reinventing things. But if we have a sense of the history, that gives you a little bit more of a flavor of where we came from, aside from manipulating the user. We have Lichtenstein, who messed with cartoons and made these paintings that are about, that's about the right size. And we have websites that still play with that. Rauschenberg, and more. And Rauschenberg took little samplings of, little, of everything and mashed them all together. This is what they say is the end goal of usability. Now, if you hire me as a graphic designer, my goal is to not make you think as well. Same thing. Role of a graphic designer, of someone creating user interfaces. The goal of an artist is a little bit different. Now I would say sometimes the role of the artist and the role of the game developer might be more in alignment because the idea is to suck you in and keep you there and keep you going. But as I would say fine arts 
is to graphic design um, the research and development portion of the art world. And it feeds into it. And if I say graphic design is HCI, uh, an HCI component, then I could argue that fine arts is R&D for HCI. So what's happening in the world of fine arts? There are happenings. Um, form of art often carefully planned, but usually including some spontaneity. These are these were things that are still happening. Uh, the happenings would be a bunch of secret t emails to to various folks saying, "All right, at 12 o'clock, show up at Macy's with an umbrella," and then. At 12.05, open your umbrellas, and then disperse quickly before the cops show up. These are the sort of happenings that might, might go on. Fine artists are playing with, with canvas still, but they're moving more into the realm of social commentary and interactivity. There's performance art, where people are just messing with other people. Um, the first example that comes to my mind is this woman who just sat in a chair. I believe this is an Italian woman in the early 90s. And she just sat by a table with various implements that could potentially hurt her. And she just sat there for a while. And then people eventually would start started prodding her to see if she would do anything. And she recorded the whole thing. And that was fascinating. Nam June Pike played with installations. So we're playing with video, and the video is sometimes triggered by the user, the viewer, the audience walking in. What is happening in the fine arts world today is the line between the viewer, the audience member, the piece, and what comes of it is changing. It's blurring. It's no longer, no longer a case of when you have installations, there's the piece, but what the piece is is greatly affected by the participants. It isn't complete until you've done something to it. In this piece, um, Ken Norwood, Ken Feingold, you would speak into a microphone. There's some artificial intelligence. This animated character would respond based upon some understanding of the text, but would not understand what you're saying clearly. So you'd have these random narratives with limited input. If you pay too much attention to your shadow, you're likely to become mad or to be killed by a passing car. But as I put my feet one after the other on these cobblestones in the alleys of the old town, I was going in deeper and deeper into it. I want to know what the input was. Um, So I'm creating installations now. Um, Liz saw this piece. But uh, this piece is, we're in the land of performances that start involving a lot of other aspects. So in this performance, I'm in a box painting with a flashlight and with actual pigment. And as, I, as I'm painting, there is a video camera that is sensing the light. And based upon the movement of the light, the animation behind me is exposed. In addition, there are live dancers and music all going on. The problems that we're experiencing now are the same problems. How do we direct the audience's focus? What do we want them to look at or listen to, attend to? Can it shift? How do we immerse them in what we want them to experience and what do we want them to experience? Questions are all the same. So we think about this as cutting edge. What happens when we take a look at other media? Interfaces are no longer a matter of point and clicks. It's not just your panel anymore. Um, 
Liz is telling me that you have systems here where your IM is hooked up to your phone. You're being bombarded by information, um, and your lives are being run by not automatons. So there are some people involved, yes? On what? I don't know. They're saying you have a meeting. So I schedule the meeting, but then the schedule tells my IM that okay. I'm in a meeting. Your calendar tells the IM that you're in a meeting. You schedule a meeting. I schedule. Other people can schedule a meeting. So the other people can tell your IM that you're engaged. Only if I agree to the meeting. <laughs> OK. <laughs> How do we play with all these different, different media? Um, I'm going to sit down. At this point, I am uncertain. But the, the experience um, of the tools needs that human interface to me. What will make something successful is if there is a scale there based on experiences that I've already had. And the sensory experiences that I've had that are good ones, aesthetics ones, um, have a proportion to my body that have texture and detail and have a history with my eyes that will communicate to me their importance and where I can put them in the queue. And if the landscape around me has a variation of tone and color and texture and importance, I feel like I have more control over it. And I'm also living more in this uh, less mechanical age. The end. <laughs> Any questions? Are you working with information designers um, at your school to explore some of these questions that you posed? Not as yet. There's one professor who is working heavily with eye tracking. So I need to come up with a study. Uh, and I have to figure out how I would ask the questions. It seems like in the realm of uh, rapid hold information design, a lot of work has been done uh, focusing, like print ads, right? Focusing attention and layout for magazines and so forth. And so some of that could be possibly explored, reapplied. Uh, we all we stumble through and we just kind of do what we do. It seems like it would uh, open up a lot of great discussion. I do. It's interesting because the programmers um, are looking at things logically. In, in steps, and I'm usually, uh, I program under duress. My motivation is to try to make cool things. So I've got an, a particular end goal in mind when I'm doing my, my work. When I talk with programmers, oftentimes they, they look at me a little bit like I'm insane, but that's okay because we start approaching the product um, from both sides simultaneously. And, Eventually, we end up with something more than either of us would have come up with alone. There's a technique that I was using is, as a design process. process. This, this person has an idea of what the interface should look like. I have an idea of what the interface should look like in terms of information and also general look and feel. And we would hit it with, uh, this person is motivated by the constraints of what is possible. And, tend to think in rectangular boxes because those are easy to do. So we would work on a sheet of paper and at 30 second intervals switch the paper, just switch sides and then I would riff on what he had done and he would riff on what I had done and he would try to make mine more practical and I would try to loosen his up and we kept going back and forth and by the end of the process we had something that neither of us would have come up with by ourselves but that was still buildable. So that was an interesting um, design process. I think that kind of discussion would be very important. Yes? I, I didn't see any impressionist examples. <laughs> 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 the reason I bring it up is because even though you don't see it in photographs, if you see the actual work on a large scale, mm -hmm. what draws your attention is level of detail. Yes. It varies or oh, actually rather sharply peaks up in areas of interest. Wouldn't work on a small screen, might be essential for large screens, 
but I don't see anybody doing work in that area, except impressions. Mm-hmm. They're all dead now, so that those. <laughs> Impressionists and, and the pointless, both. Um, if you ever saw any of Seurat's work for real, little tiny dots, the guy was insane. I would stick to the Impressionists. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but the, the Impressionists have a, a read, and this is, this is the layers of interaction. If I was to say an interface is, is a metaphor for a person at a party, um, Impressionists are great because from far away they're vibrant. But then you get closer, and there's more stuff. And you get closer still, and there's more stuff. And you get closer, and there's even more. And you can be two inches away from it, and there's just, oh my god, you see the gobs of paint. And you can see all the swirls, and it's craziness. Um, we can stack information. It's possible to, uh, now, a, the, the most benign example is a tooltip where you have some information and then you do something and you get more information. So can we treat information like um, layers of an onion? And as you delve into it, you get different information or more information. Can the type of information be varied depending on what you're looking for? I think that could be interesting too. Are you familiar with any successful examples there? Because people have played with the notion of adaptive interfaces where the task determines what you see. What's been the success or failure of those approaches? I don't, I don't know. Um, it's, I, I know in, um, in games it is somewhat frustrating. But, that, but then again, we have different aims. If you're trying to relay information as opposed to a game where you're trying to draw someone in and make them think. I find that sometimes frustrating because I will go into a particular section. <laughs> I'll go into a particular section and then I will come back to it having at a slightly different angle and then the information will have changed and it will be very difficult for me to replicate the initial, but I wanted to get the information that I got the first time around. So that becomes a different problem. How do you have that sort of consistency? Guy, did you have your hand up? Well, I was wondering if you'd seen anything in the theater these days. Uh, you're beginning to see a lot more impact of computing and set design and, and all this sort of stuff. And, and, and you see the same kind of impact. Uh, it's not exactly interactive, at least the audience for the most part is not involved. Uh, but it just looks like the developments there oh, might yes. well impact the kind of things that you're, you're talking about here. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Cirque du Soleil. Um, someone was telling me about the most recent one they have in Las Vegas. Well, you're familiar with The Matrix, where, um, where there's the requisite shot where the woman clad all in leather jumps up and for no particular reason freezes, and then we get the 360 view of her in midair. Um, so that was a special effect using photography. So in Cirque du Soleil, they have um, a battle going on. And at one point, they have the entire stage come up perpendicularly, and the actors are on um, ropes and harnesses. And they're leaping across like this. So, you, so they're getting these, these effects live. So the technology bred the theatrical experience of it. So an artificial form simulation begat this. Um, there are cases where the, the virtual is affecting the real and the real affects the virtual. In the games, um, someone, some basketball players will like make this phenomenal move and then they'll yell out to the audience, put it in the game. So there's, there's a blurring. It's happening. It's happening. Anything else? Yes. Yesterday I was uh, in a talk given by a theoretical computer scientist and one of the observations that our intuition takes in two or three dimensions, and once you go in dimensions, it spaces. I'm wondering if there is any, any here point of it, where you sort of try to recreate the intuition from multi-dimensional spaces in two or three dimensional spaces. Are there any techniques in visual art? Do you want to get the intuition of uh, multi-dimensional spaces? Well, I think... They're very complex, and you want to sort of still use it sort of a projection from multi-dimensional spaces to two or three-dimensional spaces? Um, 
I, my first thought was to think of uh, of, of Paul Clay. I, there's some fans of, if you look at Hieronymus Bosch and their, the depictions of hell, I could I could argue that the, the guy was on crack, and uh, and this is definitely a, another universe. A lot of the paintings have no basis in reality to a certain, they have multi, uh, multi there's work by the Impressionists, by the Phobos. You see early, early work, the Cubist. You have a picture of an object, a guitar, and a person playing the guitar. And you see in the same picture the image of the person playing the guitar from above, below, and the sides all in one. And it's fractured, but it's multiple viewpoints of the particular item, which is n no longer jives with our sense of reality, although it gives a sense of something else that's going down. Uh, new descending is the Sarah Crace, uh, people thought, oh, who? Duchamp. Duchamp, they thought he was, they, they, they rioted. It's like, the guy's insane. This is not art. But you see these, these photographs of people in stop motion, and what the new descending the staircase was all these, this new descending the staircase in multiple views overlaid over the other. So we have multi, multiple dimensions. We have time all compressed in this one particular image. So it's been done in a, in a flat plane, but probably not in the way that that we would guess. When we start adding time, though, that particular dimension, and you can do that in movies, and you do that in music and books, um, then it starts with, with other dimensions. I would think about Memento and Fight Club, where it's, the narrative is no longer linear in a chronological order. So artists and media are playing with, with your perception of order of events. Yes? Projections of an abstract, multi-dimensional phenomenon. There is no principle behind them. Almost all of them are ad hoc. Other questions? Well, thank you for coming.